I remember once I had a dream where I did all my homework, like, or I had a dream where I was doing all my homework, and then I woke up and I realized I didn't do any of my homework and I do it all over again. <laughs> oh yeah, and about the sleep sleepwalking thing. So this yeah. spring, yeah, sleepwalk or sleep talking. This spring on um on the spring trip with my friends, dude, Alex Kong is the he's like a sleepwalker and a sleep talker, yo. In the middle of the night, like I didn't fall asleep yet, but he was fast asleep. And he started talking like gibberish. <laughs> and he fucking got up and walked to the door. I thought he was gonna like kill somebody or something and freak me out. <laughs> Brew a podcast number 25 on a Wednesday morning. Ryan Liu, welcome back. Hello. It's good to be back. Senior spring is finally here. You excited? What are your plans for the for the term? Yeah, so um this spring I just plan on uh like lifting in the afternoon, doing center campus games. Um, nothing too crazy. I think I'm gonna try to put on some weight, like five to ten pounds. Um yeah, so got to watch my diet as well. Any plans for the summer or just focus on lifting? Uh, I'll be lifting, but I'm going to be traveling. I think I'll be visiting Korea and then my grandparents in China. When's the last time you've been to Korea? It's been a while or? Um, well, last time I've been to China has been a while and it'll be my first time going to Korea. I think I went before COVID, so like four years. How's it like being in China? You you enjoy being back home and meet, meeting everyone, or what's the vibes like over there? Um, in China, well, I live in the states, so um, I think the states is a lot cleaner, at least compared to where my grandparents live in China. Uh, also, it's pretty good to be able to read everything, like road signs stores and stuff menus because i can't even read chinese <laughs> do you find it difficult to get around or like this is mostly i'm pretty i'm assuming everything is written in chinese or like everything right so is that difficult for you or? i mean i just um i usually go with my parents but this will be the first time i'm going alone but i'll be hanging out with my grandparents and stuff so it should be okay so I think it was a week ago where we did the Mount Tamani hike, which was a lot of fun. Uh, we went to Delaware Water Gap, and I think I found out that it was, I think it's the highest point in Delaware Water Gap, but in Jersey, it's, I think, top seven or top eight. So there's definitely higher peaks, but that was a fun hike. A little difficult, but I think that it, it could have been a lot harder. I don't think it actually had killed me or you, but yeah, you enjoyed that? Oh, yeah. It was actually a lot tougher than I expected because it's been a while since I've gone hiking. I've gone hiking in um, Boy Scouts before, but... Oh, uh, yeah, it's really been a while. I think I was pretty gassed by the time we got to the top. I think um the hike was 1,500 feet elevation. And the highest point in Jersey, I think, goes to 1,800 feet, which is in, it's called High Point. The mountain's called High Point. It's a High Point State Park. It's, I think it's about an hour from my house. But I saw that. We can maybe do it again at some point, maybe in spring, uh, hit that high peak, because that would be a lot of fun. I'm yeah. down. I'm down. <laughs> um. I was in New Hampshire over the summer, as you know, and they actually have a series of mountains called the 4,000 footers. Um, so there's 48 of them, just 48, 4,000 footers. And Jersey doesn't have a single 4,000 footer, but um, my PI in my lab, I think I was telling you, right? She's trying to finish all 48 of those 4,000 footers, which seems like pretty difficult. It's more than twice as difficult as the hike that we did. But, you know, I don't think there's many options for like really, really difficult hikes in Jersey. There's definitely a lot of good nature and stuff. And as we saw, the views are there were fucking incredible. But yeah, I think I, I want to get the hiking game up. I want to do some more, do some more difficult ones. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, that's good. I'm down to go with you if uh, you want to go again. And yeah, it's lots of fun. I think Jersey had um a lot of 1,000 footers at least. I think there was like 48 or Maybe, no, there's like 60, 70, 4,000 footers. So at least while I'm here um, this spring, this summer, I'm going to try to see if I can finish as many of those 1,000 footers. I mean, I, I know the one that we did, it was up there on the top. It was like some of the hardest ones, but no, I know they're not that hard difficulty wise, but I really want to try to get as many of those like 1,000 footers in. I want to feel like I'm a Jersey hiking expert.
I think it's putting on size, same as you. <laughs> um, I didn't realize how hard it was to bulk at petty because <laughs> I never actually done bulking at petty. I always did rubber breaks, but I was pretty motivated after the wrestling season ended. And I think I did pretty decently in the week or two I had at petty. I was like being pretty disciplined about it, eating a lot. Um, but going back home, it's a lot easier. You got home cooked food. You can make your own food. You can eat it's so much easier to eat home cooked food in large quantities, especially when you're just like sitting down at home all day. So I definitely did pretty well. I put on four pounds since the end of the season. So I'm at like 124 right now. But I came back to like yesterday because <laughs> I was in Michigan for Monday. But coming back yesterday and today, just trying to eat the petty food. I forgot how difficult it was over here. <laughs> yeah, what's up? My mic is with no flashing. Oh shit, my computer shut. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, turn it back on. How long has it been doing that? I'm not sure. Do you remember? Did you, did you hear that? Like, I didn't hear it. <laughs> Are you still on Zoom? <laughs> I think, but I'm not sure. Uh... Well, I'll get as much of it as I can, but I'll cut it out. Of, so, like, just me talking by myself. <laughs> Are you unmuted? Um, well, mic is back on. Okay. I'm not in yet, so. Oh, I'll have to let you. Oh, okay. okay that's fine. I can see if you're in the Zoom. You're still in the Zoom. So if you say something right now. Hello? Yeah, yeah. I can still hear you on here. So we can just keep going. Yeah, and when it turns on, you can uh, just yeah, put on the side. Okay. <laughs> yeah, what was I saying? Um, You're muted? Yeah, I'm muted. All right, bad. Um, but yeah, it was hard. Like breakfast today. I think Wednesday does have the worst breakfast at Petty because it's just like eggs and waffles. And I was like pretty good about not eating unhealthy over the break. Um, I know we were talking about last time about eating healthy and stuff. I think I was listening to the podcast we were talking about with Huberman and Lustig. And one thing they mentioned is that ideally you shouldn't consume anything with more than four ingredients. And I realized that the one, two things I was having in my diet that had more than two ingredients were the bread I was eating because bread has a lot of sh shit they put in there and then cheese that I put in my omelet. But I stopped putting cheese in the omelet, and then I I got a bread that still had more than four ingredients, but it was better because it was like no sugar, like sourdough bread, and it didn't taste as good, but uh, it did the job with peanut butter and stuff. But um, yeah, come back to Petty, eating shitty processed food again because <laughs> you kind of have to, to get the calories in, and then it's going to be hard, but I don't know. I'm in the same boat. We'll see what we can do. Putting on size for a spring turn, that's the main goal, but really just trying to get myself in the best shape as possible before I step foot on campus in this, in uh, the fall. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I feel like it's probably doubly hard if you're a vegetarian, but um, I think over the summer at home, I got up to like around 167 once when I stepped on the scale versus wrestling season, I was 157. One day I stepped on there, I think I was like 155. So I lost more than 10 pounds just being at Petty. And I've, I've been eating like as much as I can. So yeah, it's a struggle. Um, I think yesterday I stepped back on the scale. I was 160 with shoes on. So I think we're making a little bit of progress. But I'm trying to get back up to like 165, 167 before the school year ends. But it'll definitely be a struggle. Yeah. Last summer, I so last year I wrestled at 113. Um. I was I entered the summer at 120 because I'd cut down to get to 113. And then by the end of summer, I was 130. So I put 10 pounds on that summer. And I come out to Petty. Within a few weeks, I'm back down like 126. <laughs> and then season comes, I'm, at, I'm wrestling at 120. So I lost like 10 pounds as well. But yeah, I mean, I, I think gaining back the weight you lost is not as difficult as trying to gain it from fresh. Because I remember last year when I cut down to 113, I gained back to 120. Like literally in spring break, I gained that seven pounds back. The sun's been a little slower because I wasn't as consistent over break. Last year over break, I was literally just eating and lifting. But this year, I spent some time like doing hikes and stuff, so more cardio and traveling and stuff. So it wasn't as consistent with my stuff, but it was enough to get me back up four pounds. And, you know, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Just being consistent with it. I think sometimes it can get monotonous, too, because I feel like it's fun to add other things to your lifestyle as well. Like I think wrestling was a lot of fun and doing kind of sports is fun. But at the same time, it hinders your performance with bulking. At least for me, I realized, because whenever I do any cardio, it just I don't gain any weight, and it's really the trade off. Is like, do I want to value a really active, fun lifestyle, or do I want to value just putting on muscle? But I feel like you have, to, I guess, you have to rotate between different times. Where I think right now I care really a lot about getting that, meeting that goal threshold, and then maybe when I transition into fall term, I can do some more lifestyle fun stuff as well. But what do you think about that? Yeah, I think um, 
Well, I don't think cardio is a bad thing. Like, yeah, it'll make it harder for you to put on weight and stuff. But like right now I'm doing center campus games. So we're just running around all day and it's super fun. So I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think the point of gaining weight, putting on muscle anyway, the whole point is to enjoy life, you know, to feel better about yourself and to have fun. Um, Like, I don't think either of us are going to like compete in bodybuilding or something like that, or maybe, maybe at least not in the near future. So if it's just for yourself and it's just for your own happiness, then, you know, just try to enjoy life. That's what I think. So um, when it comes down to like running around with friends outside, I think you shouldn't cut it out. You shouldn't cut out hiking. Just enjoy life. Yeah, I was thinking about that as well, because the idea of me just sitting in my room all summer eating and lifting, that's kind of dreary. But I think I'm I'm going to try to find a middle ground where I was thinking I go on a hike like once every two weeks, right? Because I don't think that's going to hinder my progress so much that it's like, I, I think adding in elements where you can enjoy life, um, try to, I like, I think the hiking is a great like social aspect, right? You can bring some friends, go out in nature. I think being in nature is like so important as well, because we spend so much time indoors, Yeah, which I think that's also correlated with like the depression, the rise of depression these days, because sunlight is so essential for just feeling like well-being. And they, I think there's a measurement, you know, like Lux, right? Lux is the measurement of light. I think the sun produces like 100,000 Lux and these light bulbs inside produce like 10 to 100 Lux, which we're basically living in like darkness. <laughs> like obviously we could see each other, but yeah, I think being outside, being in nature, I think those things that add to the happiness of life that you're talking about. I want to add some of that more. I try to spend more time outside and try to see if I can do that more at spring term this year. Um, I started campus games. Like, who who else is doing that? I might like pop in a few times. <laughs> uh, it's pretty fun. Um, it's like there's me. There's uh, other Ryan Liu. I'm with Kate. There's Angad there. Like, there's lots of people there. Stiza, whoever. It's pretty fun. Playing capture the flag and stuff like that. But like to um get back to the the sunlight thing it's like so it's so true because you're not getting like you know you're not getting vitamin d inside with like a light bulb and um it also depends on like the type of light you know like blue light or stuff like that it really wakes you up you need a uh you need to go outside to like set your like <laughs> night day time cycle so that you can fall asleep that's what I've realized because I can't fall asleep unless like everything's, you know, perfect, I guess. And I need to get some sunlight in the morning and I need to get some darkness before bed. But if you just stay inside all day, um, even if you're trying to do something good, like lift and be healthy, you're going to be missing out on some like nature and, you know, natural sunlight. Do you still do your morning sunlight thing or at, here at Petty? Um, I mean, I kind of just go straight to class. So, I mean, I get some sunlight on the way there. It's like, uh, not that big of a deal. I think like over break, honestly, I was, my sleep cycle was really bad. I was, I think the worst day I went to sleep at 4 AM and got up at one. So it's not ideal. I mean, I'm getting the hours in, but like, there's all sorts of stuff. I saw this one thing where it's like, uh, if you normally sleep at like say 11 o'clock and then one day you sleep later than 11, like 12 or one o'clock, you go to sleep at one o'clock, you get the same hour number of hours of sleep. Like you get eight hours of sleep. Uh, you, you won't get the same like growth hormone release as if you slept um, at the same time. So like consistency in your sleep is very essential. And uh yeah so i was kind of missing out on some of that but honestly it's pretty fun to staying up so do you feel the difference during the day i mean do you feel more lazy or tired during the day or how, how do you compare the two yeah i think i was much more lethargic like i think the day i stayed up it's like a day or two before i went hiking with you but after i went hiking with you like i realized like i had the whole day ahead of me like when we got back to my house that's like normally when i would wake up so <laughs> I felt like I still had the whole day in front of me and um, I was much more energetic. Uh, yeah, so it, I think it really does make a difference when you sleep, not just how long you sleep. I know we talked last time. I stopped the early morning wake up thing. I'm thinking about going back. <laughs> I did today because 
I was supposed to work last night after dinner, but I was just so tired. Um, so I'm like, I'm going to sleep early, wake up. And waking up was kind of hard, but honestly, it felt kind of good because I, I was doing it for all of fall term at Petty. And then I stopped doing it in January, February. And I think it was, I'm glad I stopped doing it because at the time it, didn't, it felt kind of like, what's the point? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm decided if I'm fully committing it, but it takes so much stress out of you when you just wake up early and get your work done because I was like, I don't have to worry about schoolwork all day. And it's really finding that balance. Like, I guess getting up is kind of hard. You miss out on some things if you sleep early, but I don't know, man. It's just, there's so many pros behind it that I'm, I'm considering going back. Yeah, I think for me, I just can't fall asleep at night very easily. So I need every hour of sleep that I can get. So that kind of prevents me from getting up early. Like Ideally, if I could fall asleep whenever I wanted, I'd go to sleep at like 10 or 11 and get up early to do my work. But it's just uh, a little bit hard for me to do that. I think it really depends on like your body. Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't just like, if somebody says you should go to sleep at a certain time, you have to listen to your own body. You can't just take their word for it because everybody's different. And you should do whatever you think would make you feel the best. And for me, it's um, like sleeping in a little bit, as much as I can at least. Yeah, I mean, you got to experiment with it. Um, there's no one size fits all solution, right? You got to play around with it. I mean, if you're okay with working in the day and you feel fine, then there's no reason to wake up early, right? I mean, if I had the choice, I think I... I the feeling I get when I wake up when the sun's out is actually a really good feeling. I don't know why that is because it doesn't even matter what time it is because if it's, I remember over break, we had daylight savings, right? I was getting up at around 6.45 or 7 for the first week. And whenever the sun would come up, I would always wake up and then my alarm would go off. So I'd wake up like right before my alarm goes off. And then that was like the best feeling in the world because then I, I, it was so easy to get up. But as soon as daylight savings hit, I was getting up at the same time, but it was so much harder because it's dark outside and I'm like it feels like it's so much earlier than it actually is but it's a good feeling when you wake up when the sun's out that I've compared because there have been so many for so long I've gotten up like even to this morning like it was kind of hard to get up at 5 30 but I think that hardness feeling is one of the reasons I stopped doing it but then I realized it goes away really fast because sure getting up was hard cold shower is hard and then then you feel fine <laughs> so as long as I, I don't feel like I'm a slave to it, as long as I'm able to balance it out, maybe once in a while I'll sleep in type thing, but we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, I don't know why that is. I don't know why it feels so good to wake up when the sun is out. I mean, I think it just goes back to like, um, like how we've evolved as humans. Like, uh, like back in the day before we had light bulbs and stuff, like you wake up when it gets warm out, when the sun comes out and you go to sleep when it's cold and when it's dark, which is why it's easier to fall asleep when it's cold and dark and easier to get up when the sun's out. Um, but I think what you're doing is like, it's pretty impressive. It's really disciplined and I definitely cannot do that. But uh, I think if you feel like it is taking over your life and since you have like the ability to get up that early, maybe just let yourself wake up naturally, like go to sleep really early and um, after a certain point, you kind of just wake up by yourself. If you can wake up to an alarm at 5.30, I think you can, um, like you can get up naturally too. Because even for me, uh, when the days get a bit longer, I kind of wake up naturally as well. Like I can't fall asleep. And then I wake up by myself really early in the morning and it's kind of bad for me. I don't know. It happens to me like, Later on in the spring, I feel it a lot, but you might be able to use that to your advantage. I mean, that's true for when I was waking up around seven, but historically, I've never been able to naturally wake up at 530. So I always have to wake up for my alarm because even the days I didn't put an alarm on, like on a Sunday, I don't know, getting like up at like an hour or so after the alarm. So I think with that early time, I kind of need that alarm, even though I sleep early. Um, I don't know why that is, but yeah, it's, it's if I can get up naturally, if I, I know some people do that, that would be incredible. <laughs> um but yeah, I don't think I'm at that point yet. Maybe, maybe one day. <laughs> mm, so I think I'm a pretty light sleeper. And when I learned that there's like three hour sleep cycles and stuff, like it really made a lot of sense to me because I wake up, I feel like every three hours, like a little bit, I wake up and I get a sip of water and I go back to sleep. And, you know, one time I was really curious, I checked my phone and I would wake up naturally once at six and then I'd go back to sleep and then I'd wake up to my alarm 
at like seven ish. So halfway through my like sleep cycle, I'd be like really sleepy and stuff. So for me, I think I could get up naturally at six because I would wake up by myself at that time. But I think that might just be me and other light sleepers. So depends on the person. Wait, so what is this three hour sleep schedule thing you're talking about? I don't, I've never heard of that before. Yeah, so I think sleep hasn't really been researched that much. Like we're learning in anatomy that there's like a bunch of theories for even why we sleep. Like people never question that. Like, why do we even sleep, you know? And we learned a few of those theories. It's like for um like forgetting things that you don't need and like remembering things that you do need and like getting rid of like junk in your brain, like physical like buildup of trash basically waste products in your brain and stuff like that so uh but scientists aren't actually really sure why we sleep they're not 100 percent sure why we even do it so it's not very well researched but different sources say different things about how long your sleep cycle is and stuff but from what i've heard some people say like one and a half hours or three hours but either way it's like you know there's these chunks of time where you go like in and out of deep sleep out of REM sleep and at the end of each cycle, you're you're going to be like more easily awoken versus in the middle of a cycle, it's going to be really hard to wake you. And it's better to wake up at the end of a cycle versus in the middle. And it's going to be easier for you to wake up as well. So say you fall asleep um, after three hours, I would like kind of wake up a little bit and take a sip of water and then I go back to sleep and around three hours later, I would wake up again. And I've just noticed that. So I do think it's pretty true. Uh, over break, I feel like I would sleep for like nine hours, which makes sense based on um, this like three hour theory, I guess. So when you say three hours, it's basically like a sine wave type thing where you're going in and out of deep sleep, light sleep, REM sleep, and you're kind of cycling through it and the cycle lasts for three hours. And there's certain periods in this cycle where you're sleeping lighter, so it's easiest to wake you up. Is that really what it's talking about? Or yeah, like at the end of each cycle. And I think there's something about it like speeding up as you go closer to the morning. But uh I think it'll vary from person to person, definitely. Because I don't think everybody notices this. Um and maybe everybody's sleep cycle is a little bit different. So you have to listen to your own body. But yeah. Yeah. I think the sleep research community, I think Matthew Walker is that one figure that we look at as leading the, the pioneering the sleep research. And I read one of his books, Why We Sleep, which is literally the question he asked, like, why do we sleep? And he said the same thing that most of us don't really know. Most scientists don't know why we sleep. But what he goes on to show through his research is that it's all for the brain, which kind of makes sense, right? You mentioned forgetting things and memories, which is related to the brain as well. But I never, before I read that book, I never correlated sleeping with the brain. Because sure, sleeping is something you do to rest your body and rest yourself. But what does it mean yourself was the question. And I guess a lot of that comes from the brain because your brain needs rest as well. And your brain, I think it goes through this process where it helps to enhance memory and it helps you to forget memories, which is, I think, related to dreaming as well, um, forgetting memories. And it's amazing how your brain can even like pick and choose what it wants to remember, what's what it feels like it's important to remember, which I thought was pretty incredible. But yeah, I mean, there's a, I think neuroscience is really interesting to me because the way our brain function explains so much about how we function on a, on a data basis, which I think is really cool. And, you know, sleep ties into it, which is incredible. Yeah, I really think that's going to be like the next area of scientific research because when it comes to like other parts of your body, to say like your other organs, your heart, your muscles, for things like that, we know how to find out. Um, like new data or evidence for whatever theories that we have. We we just like, you know, we dissect it, we do experiments and stuff like that. But for sleep, for like consciousness, for your brain, we don't know how to approach those types of things. Uh, we can't just dissect a brain and figure out why we sleep. And that's why it's so difficult, why it's not been done yet. And why I think like, um, like people going into neuroscience today will probably be the ones who might have a shot at figuring it out it's like really the next frontier of like biology i guess human biology also dreams are really freaking cool too 
Um, I never really understood dreams. Like I, I just figured that it's just random thoughts you have throughout the day, just manifesting into some storyline. So I never really thought too much about dreams, but I heard an interesting perspective from some. Not he's not a scientist, but some interesting perspective about um, what dreams really are, and the way he described it really showed that I think dreams have more inherent meaning than we ascribe to them. Because I've always thought of dreams as this random storyline, like meaningless. But when I thought about dreams, the perspective that he showed, it kind of showed me that I think there is more deeper meaning in dreams. That if you look at our dreams and we try to understand like the analogy behind it, it's kind of telling us something about our life, which I think is cool. Um, the way he described it was that we have a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. Um, the conscious mind is the one that's speaking to me and you right now, that's interacting with each other, that's solving problems, that's thinking through things, like thinking, what should I do today, planning the future, thinking about the past. Like That's all your conscious mind. Your subconscious mind is happening in the background and it's processing information around you with you consciously being aware of it, right? So it can it's it has all your memory base in there. It has a lot of other stimulus in this room that we're not like conscious about. Like there's so much stimulus in this room that we can't physically like, be conscious about all of it at the same time. Like things like the color of the door, I'm thinking about it right now, but when I wasn't thinking about it, it was there. I can see it with my eyes, but it's more in the subconscious of my mind. And that's why when a lot of people, have you heard the, the concept of like, let your subconscious mind deal with the problem and not think about it? Um, I've heard this before. I think Cal Newport was talking about it in his book. I think that's where it came from. But sometimes if you, you're trying to deal with some big life problem or some like maybe school problem that you just can't figure out and you just take a break away from it, you might not be consciously thinking about it, but your subconscious mind is thinking about it, which is why when you come back to the problem, you might see it in a new light because your subconscious mind kind of worked through it and did it for you, which I think is pretty cool. But we know but we know all this about the subconscious mind, but in reality, we don't really know much about how our subconscious mind functions. Like, what does it look like? What does it think like? But there are certain gateways that we can use that causes our conscious mind to turn off and cause us to look back into our subconscious mind, right? Like psychedelics, I think are a great example. I... I don't know much about the psychedelic community and stuff about what it does to you, but what makes sense to me is that when you take a psychedelic, it kind of allows you to see your subconscious mind. Have you heard about psychedelics before? Yeah. Um, yeah. To talk about what you just said, I think I've definitely noticed that in my own life when I was writing my senior thesis, like I'd be stuck on wording or an idea and then I'd go do whatever else I need to do during my day and come back to it. And I could write again. And I would write in like short bursts where like, you know, maybe my subconscious mind was doing the work for me while I was doing something else. So I've noticed that. And um, yeah, so about dreams, I dream a lot. Like I think I dream almost every day. And like I always wake up and I remember it. And if I keep on thinking about it, like I could remember it. But I don't know. Like, I forgot what I dreamed about this morning. But I did have a dream. <laughs> and I think also uh, compared to other people, I think like, I have a lot more dreams and like a lot more intense dreams. Like, I've had like lucid dreams before. Um, There's one summer where I had a lot of like sleep paralysis. And <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I think it's really interesting how everybody's a bit different. In their subconscious yeah so kind of like how psychedelics help you access your subconscious state i think the the best analogy is that when you're sleeping your conscious mind turns off so you can see your subconscious mind right so it's kind of like you're dreaming all the time in the background like that's how your subconscious mind is thinking we just don't see it so maybe when our conscious mind turns off we're able to see the subconscious mind which i think is like a cool concept maybe if it's not even literally factually true it gives us a good perspective of like what is our dream it's just how our subconscious mind looks at the world and there have been people in the past who have kept a dream journal. Um, my dad is a friend who's done it, but wants to see, you know, Rick Rubin, right? He keeps, Rick Rubin is like a music producer who's worked with like Eminem and a lot of big names, but um, he also keeps a dream journal. And what he's noticed is that in the moment, like if you, if you look at whatever you dreamed about last night, if you can remember it, it probably doesn't have much inherent meaning. But what he noticed was that when he looked back at his dreams, like four or five months later, and in the context of that period of his life, it's like it made so much sense what his dream was trying to tell him, right? Like, it's like your subconscious mind looks at the world through analogies. And it it's it basically has some inherent meaning inside of it. We just can't really understand it because when we're so encompassed in our current life, 
we don't really see the meaning of this stage of our life. But if you look back at previous times in, our, in your life, you can make these post hoc, post hoc stories about like, oh yeah, that's my lesson from this period of my life. That's what I was doing in this period. But you can't really see them until you're in a third person perspective and can understand um, the meaning of that dream. But another interesting thing is that your dream, it, it tries to send you that message through the method that you learn best. For example, me, I, I see the world through a lot of like, I, I think a lot of like philosophy and stuff. And I, I try to, I think my way through a lot of problems and I, I learn best like through analogies and looking through things like in different pictures. And because of that, my dreams, there's, there's often like analogies, like statements or like philosophical statements that connect back to some other meaning in my life, which I can try to think of an example of something I had recently, but it's often like through an analogy or but for example, my mom, she said that she learns best through like actually doing and movement and doing it herself. And she, when I asked her about what are your dreams like, she's like, she moves a lot in her dreams. Like her dreams have a lot of movement in them. And I even asked her about one of the dreams she had um, recently. Um, so we were in Michigan and the plan was that we had one open day. So we were like thinking about what to do before the campus day, which is on Monday. And one thing we want to do is like check out some of the houses in the area because um, ideally... A lot, most people in Michigan, they they move out their second year and live on their own. So we were going to look at some houses and then we were also going to um, do like a small trail nearby because like we had some time in the morning. Like it's kind of like a hike, but a kind of small one. But um, but yeah, my mom, she historically has kind of been afraid of safety on hikes and she always feels more comfortable when there's a lot of people there. Um, and then when we know about like, like there's no animals here because she's sometimes worried that there'll be animals on the trail, right? Um so the dream that she had, and by the way, she also like really enjoys like, looking at houses and stuff. Like she she enjoys that whole up. Uh, she finds it fun. But the dream she had that night, which by the way, she had she thought there was no meaning behind it. She thought it was just like useless stuff, right? Oh. So she was in some house. It was a big like man, like it was not a mansion, but it was a pretty big house. And it was like getting dark evening, and there's someone outside, and they have a big garden in their, in their backyard, and there was a lawnmower who's cutting the grass or something. And for some reason, as a as it's getting darker and night, she has, has to go out of the garden and go on a long walk around the um around the to the the house to the front of the house. And as she's going along along the walk, she starts to see little animals, right? So she's squirrels running by and bunnies, and then this deer, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And she's going going on and on and on, and then. She eventually sees some like pretty big animals, like there's like big like, ostrich or rooster looking animal. And at first sees her and walks away, but then it starts walking towards her. And then she's trying to shoot away. And she actually starts sleep talking at this point. I'm sleeping in the same room as her. So I got really freaked out. She was like making some demonic like song type sound in the middle. It was pretty fucking scary. That's a separate story. That's why I asked her about the dream in the first place. But she's trying to shoot the animal away and get rid of it. And that's when I woke her up. Like, why are you singing? <laughs> but um, yeah, she told me the dream. She's like, oh, yeah, it's a dream. And I asked her, like, do you think there's a meaning behind the dream? And she's like, she doesn't think so. I mean, it's just a, just a random, like, I'm just walking in my garden. And I thought about it. First of all, I saw there's a lot of movement, which correlates with how she learns. But also, well, she was thinking a lot about houses during the day. And she seemed to be in a house. So that's probably something she was thinking about, which is probably why the dream was placed in the context of that. And then she is also really afraid. She might have been thinking about the hike, and maybe she was a little worried about it. But maybe she wasn't really consciously thinking about that. Maybe she was kind of worried about it in the background of her mind. And this is kind of her subconscious way of being worried about a hike. It's a long walk around the house with animals. And I told her that, aren't you scared of animals on, on trails? And she's like, oh, yeah, it makes kind of sense. It was kind of like an analogy that I was trying to tell her that. Which I thought was pretty fucking cool. <laughs> um, another example, I was... It was the day before we were leaving for Michigan. We were leaving at 10. I always pack like last minute. So I'm like, I'll just pack tomorrow morning. I'll throw my clothes in the suitcase. It's three days. It's not that bad. Um, and I think I write down on like a sticky note or in my notebook that don't forget to pack tomorrow morning. So I see you the next morning. And then I said, okay, I stopped thinking about it. So it's probably gone to my subconscious mind to remember it. And then the dream I have that night is that I, I wake up late. It's 9.20. I forgot to pack <laughs> and I'm like struggling to put everything and my dad's yelling at me that I didn't pack the night before and I'm, I'm rushing and rushing. And that's probably my subconscious mind's method of remembering not to, for, not to forget packing. Yeah. So there's a lot of more examples I thought about recently. Like the night before I came back to Petty, um, I was having dreams that I was late to class. And stuff. <laughs> but I don't know, maybe that's just a subconscious mind's way of looking at the world, which I think is just incredible. Yeah, like I totally agree with you on that. I think your mind really likes to focus on like fears and worries um i think some of my most vivid memories are the most scary ones and i definitely agree with your uh like worries about school thing i remember once i had a dream where 
I did all my homework like, or I had a dream where I was doing all my homework and then I woke up and I realized I didn't do any of my homework and I do it all over again. <laughs> oh yeah. And about the sleep, sleepwalking thing. So this spring, yeah, sleepwalk or sleep talking. This spring on, um, on the spring trip with my friends, dude, Alex Kong is the, he's like a sleepwalker and a sleep talker, yo. In the middle of the night, like I didn't fall asleep yet, but he was fast asleep and he started talking like gibberish <laughs> and he fucking got up and walked to the door. I thought he was going to like kill somebody or something and freak me out. <laughs> That's scary, bro. I mean, my, my dad sometimes sleep talks. Like when I was younger, I would sometimes recognize it. Like if he's sleeping during the day, sometimes he would sleep talk. Uh, my mom is actually good about it, but the sound she was making was scary, bro. It was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, is there a ghost in this room or is that my mom? <laughs> I started calling her name. Um, and I'm like, oh, she's like, oh, sorry. <laughs> and then started laughing. I think she's like, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. And then she goes like to sleep. And then an hour later, I see her walking. I'm like, okay. And she, it was like dark. So I was like, I remember I literally thought to myself, like that right now it sounds funny, but in the moment I really thought to myself, okay, is this a ghost or my mom? And if it's a ghost, like, how do we deal with the situation? <laughs> and I call her name. It was just her. She's going to the bathroom. <laughs> but do we know why people sleepwalk? Because I don't know. I've not heard any signs behind it or anything. It's a good question. I think, um, I mean, I, I don't know anything, but like if I had to guess, it would be um, like normally in sleep, I think your body is paralyzed besides your like eyes, like your eyes still move in REM sleep. Um, but it could be something to do with like you're dreaming and you're like acting it out because something's wrong with like, like you can't, your body's not paralyzed basically. Um, yeah, I don't know why I would do that, but that's just my, that's what I think. I search it up. I got a computer open. Uh, why do we sleepwalk? But then I'll check the cameras. Oh shit. Yeah. No, I just turned off. Come on. I didn't get anything, bro. I think I forgot I think I forgot to hit the board. Shit. Okay, let me leave it up and go, bro. That's the go. Okay, no, we're good. Alright, well the first 45 minutes is gonna be it's fine. Oh it's the 45 already? Yeah, bro. Yeah, we we thought 45 minutes worth of sleep talk, bro. Well. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Oh, we got. Continue? Yeah, are you unmuted? I'm right now. Okay, you can you can go ahead. Tell me what you got. Okay, but it says here that it's unknown, but it seems to run in families, and um, you're more likely to sleepwalk if other members of your close family have or had sleepwalking behaviors or night terrors, and you're more likely to sleepwalk if you haven't gotten no sleep. So it's it's interesting. I think um the fact that it's genetic. Or runs in your family. I feel like it could be like, uh, like there's something wrong, you know, like a genetic disorder or something where your body isn't paralyzed. So I think it kind of makes sense. I'm not sure though. Yeah, it's definitely a genetic component to it, but interesting. Sleep paralysis is also scary because it it feels horrible. Um, at least like what I think of a sleep paralysis, where it's like, um, like you can't really move your body, right? Uh, it's not happened to me in a while, but. You kind of think you're trying to wake up, but you can't really wake up. Is that the feeling? Um, it, I've, I've seen it historically happen to me when I happen to be listening to music when I sleep or I'm watching like a listening to podcasts and I fall asleep listening to that. Because the last time it happened to me was on, I was on a flight in December. Um, and I think I was listening to some Joe Rogan podcast and I fell asleep listening to it. I'm quite disappointed about because I think it was a pretty interesting one. I slept through like most of it. But um, yeah, I remember I... I was trying to get up and I couldn't get up. <laughs> that was pretty bad. And then I used to sometimes, I used to play a lot more music before, like over the summers and like years ago. And sometimes I, I take a nap in the day and the speaker just left it playing and then I get that sleep paralysis and it's such a horrible feeling. But does it happen to you often? You said you're a pretty, uh, pretty dreamy guy. <laughs> it hasn't happened to me in a while, but I think in my sophomore summer, it happened like a lot. I'm not sure why still to this day, but... I remember one week, I think I got it every night of the week. And I was like, so afraid to go to sleep. I think 
um, like that experience kind of played into my like sleep anxiety a little bit. I feel like I really started focusing on getting good sleep after that point um, where I was really sleep deprived every day because I didn't want to go to sleep. But yeah, it's kind of what you said. I never really listen to music and then go to sleep or listen to a podcast and fall asleep to that. Um, but I don't know. I just wake up. There's like this heavy feeling on you and the, like the edges of my vision are blurred. And it's like, it's like a filter on your phone where it's like, you know, the corners are black and stuff, but it's actually like so real and it doesn't feel like a filter or anything like that. And I can't move. And I remember one time I was trying to scream, but like I couldn't scream. Yeah. That's the worst feeling. Pretty crazy. Yeah, search up why that happens as well. If you don't mind. Yeah, the the feeling of like not being able to scream is like so real. That shit is like fucking painful, bro. Yeah, I think it's like the opposite of um of sleepwalking. It's like sleepwalking is when your body is awake, but your mind is still asleep. Versus sleep paralysis is when your mind is awake, but your body's asleep. Like you're paralyzed. The paralysis is working fine, but your mind is awake. So it says, um, during REM sleep, you're more likely to have dreams and your brain prevents muscles in your limbs from moving to protect yourself from acting dreams out and hurting yourself. Sleep paralysis happens when you regain awareness going into or coming out of REM. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess it's like when you're still paralyzed, but I guess you gain consciousness before you're fully, you know, out or in REM sleep. What is it like to lose a dream? Because it doesn't happen to me a lot. Maybe it's happened once or twice, but does it happen to you often? And what does it feel like? Oh, yeah. So I feel like sometimes I just notice that I'm dreaming. It just happens sometimes. Um, And... I could choose to like forget about it and just continue dreaming or I could choose to remember and like wake myself up. But occasionally I can't wake myself up and I just start lucid dreaming and then I could just do like whatever I want. kind of. <laughs> I remember lucid dreaming once and it was pretty amazing. I can't remember the context of the dream, but I remember waking up being like, wow, I really like you have control over like everything around you. You can literally do anything, which is like insane because you can't really do it in the real world. But um, yeah, it's, it's happened to me like once, but I think it's pretty incredible. Yeah, I think like yo, when I lose a dream, I could just like teleport wherever I want. <laughs> um I don't know. But the thing is, when I'm lucid dreaming, I honestly don't feel like I have full control. The only thing I know is that, like I'm aware of being in the dream. But there's like lots of things that I would want to do in a lucid dream when I'm awake. Like right now, if I knew I was gonna lose a dream tonight, I tell myself to like do my homework or like something like that in my dream. And then I could wake up and do it or something, you know? But like when I'm in the lucid dream, I like don't remember what I want. I'm just kind of there and I know I'm dreaming, but kind of stuck too. I mean, scientific research keeps coming out and coming out, but I think it's probably like the, the magic of dreaming. It's probably better to leave it as like this wonder, wondrous kind of thing instead of giving it reason. Because I think we've given so much of the world around us so much reason and order and a reason for why it exists in that way. And it's taking out so much of the childlike wonder that makes the world a beautiful place, right? I think I have so many experiences where I, I genuinely have a appreciation and curiosity for the world, and that feels really good. Um, I remember I heard this quote from some astronaut that's working with Jeff Bezos on uh, Blue Origin. And when he went up to space, like every astronaut goes up to space and looks back at Earth, they always have these amazing realizations, and it seems so amazing. And what he said was that when he went up to space and looked back at Earth, he realized that you don't go to heaven when you die. You go to heaven when you're born. Because everywhere around you is this darkness, 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 and this one gem of life called Earth. And that really, like, sure, we have all these reasons for how everything came to be, but that really puts you back in the shoes of, like, this childlike wonder that really makes the world a special place. That's pretty deep. But I think to argue against that, I think there's so much to be gained from learning about why we sleep. Because if you think about it, right now we're all trying to live like as long as we can. Like there's so much anti-aging research, like how do we live forever and stuff? Because we're all afraid of dying. But if you think about it, if we didn't need to sleep, our lifespan would like almost double. Think about it. Because 
you're unconscious for like, I don't know, seven, eight hours a day, every day of your life. And if you could just be conscious throughout all that, you would have so much life experience. So if we did figure out why we needed to sleep and um, stuff like that, then if there's a way to get rid of this need and like supplement it in some other way, like imagine if there was a pill, you could just take it. It cleaned out your brain, like fixed all whatever memories you needed to do and stuff like that. And you could be conscious for much longer. That would be like absolutely incredible it would allow so much more like productivity in the world there'd be so much more inventions because all these scientists they don't need to go to sleep anymore all these researchers all these like important people they could work all day or they could take that time out and spend it with their friends and there's like so many possibilities it's not that you have to stay awake like what if there was a way to make everybody able to lucid dream every night you know then you could not only like do whatever you want but um I don't know. Like, I feel like time perception in your dreams is completely different too. Like, what if you could just live out an entire life while you're dreaming in one night? Then you could live forever if you think about it. I don't know. Some interesting ideas. Yeah, I mean, us talking about the negative side of research is not going to make the research stop. <laughs> That's not happening. But another side of it, like, like, what's the point? Like, you're going to die eventually. So what's the point of trying to optimize, like, your time on this earth and, like, live for as long as possible? If It's going to happen eventually, right? And I think that the fact that we are going to die, the fact that we have a limited time on this earth, and the fact that um, we can't live forever is what makes life beautiful, I think. I think that's what makes things around us precious. And, you know, we can go down the rabbit hole of trying to optimize our time on this earth, or we can just kind of appreciate what we have, right? This sleep is such a beautiful thing that I think a lot of people look forward to every day. Like, it's like this fun relaxing thing and sure you can take a pill and then do more stuff but i think that's one of the things that i i enjoy as a part of the cycle cyclic nature of a human nature and i think it i think sleep can be used as an analogy to like other parts of our life right that we're designed in a way that we're not meant to be on go mode all the time we're meant to take breaks and i think that can even correlate to even your work life right like sure you you work three four months at a time and you take a month off because we live in that cyclic nature and if you never leave your day-to-day -day life, then you're so wrapped up in the bubble that you lose perspective, right? You lose like the meaning behind it. But I noticed that when I go on breaks, like go on March break, go on summer break, or like even take a week out away from my work, you see it in like, third, like you're pulled out of it, you see it in third person. Then you can really understand, you can look at it and you can critique it and you can adjust it. And I think that single nature is a beautiful part of our, our human nature. So I don't know if there's, the, sure the research is going to go on, but I don't think there's like, so much so much value in trying to over optimize everything you know okay so i think i would have to disagree with you because uh i agree with the breaks thing like taking breaks is absolutely necessary if you're working all day and stuff but sleep as a break the reason you feel so rested after sleep is because like your body is recovering and like your brain's recovering as you were talking about. But um, uh, it's not like if there was like a pill that could um, get rid of your need to sleep, it could do all those things. It could like recover your muscles. It could um, like recover your mind. It doesn't have to be a pill, obviously. I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm sure somebody's going to come up with something, you know? And you'd get all those feelings of like refreshment when you wake up that that feeling of being refreshed it can come with that pill it can come with whatever it is that's invented it's not unique to sleep i think and in fact i think if we somehow get the ability to manipulate how we dream and allow us to all lucid dream at night every night that could serve as a break imagine uh like a long day of work and then you go to sleep, but you know, you take this lucid dream pill and you could like take a whole week's break off in one night because you know, time perception is different. You could have like a winter break or a spring break every day. You could have a summer vacation every day. You could have like a whole lifetime of uh like relaxing every night just by this pill, you know. But how would you respond to the point that being able to do it every night? kind of takes some meaning away from it right like the fact that we're going to die is what gives life meaning the fact that we can't go on a summer vacation every day 
is what gives a summer vacation meaning that yeah. somehow the pill could take that into account as well or do you think that's that's true no i agree with you i think um you can't have something good without having something bad right if you have summer break every night <laughs> like every every summer break it wouldn't be that meaningful anymore but it's also kind of inevitable that we get to that point like this is just i'm talking about like society and like life in general even if like let's not talk about sleep but one day i think if everything goes well and like you know humans don't blow each other up and stuff our technology will advance to the point where we might not need to work maybe not our generation but imagine a few generations down the line where nobody has to work right and most pain and suffering has been taken away from the world it's kind of an ethical question that we'll have to deal with anyway, regardless of whether or not um, the sleep thing comes about. It's the question of once you don't have to do anything uh, like painful, then like, what's the point? You know what I'm saying? Like you have everything, but you won't be enjoying it for long because your brain always craves like novel experiences. So maybe people will turn to like, you know, drugs, I give you an artificial high. Maybe people will like, you know, bring pain about themselves. That's what some people do. I feel like, um, like you and me forcing ourselves to do things that are hard is part of that. Forcing yourself to wake up every morning, even if you might not want to, it's for the rest of your day to feel amazing because you have something to compare it to. Do you think that idealized future of elimination of pain and suffering is even possible? Because I do agree that our our civilization will advance a lot, right? And in terms of just progress, if you look at most statistics in terms of human progress, they're all positive, right? Child mortality has decreased. Hunger or famine worldwide has decreased. Um, on, on average, we all live pretty, pretty good lives, right? We all live um, lives that our great-grandparents would think was insane, impossible even. So I do agree that we're making this really rapid progress, but every statistic is positive except for one, and that's human well-being. Because depression has really skyrocketed, and suicide rates really skyrocketed, which really shows that I think it's all relative. That even if you get all the cool technologies and this comfortable lifestyle, well, that's a new baseline. And I think your happiness and tons of dissatisfaction and pain and suffering is all around that baseline. Like if our food come, if our DoorDash comes an hour late, we feel a lot of pain and suffering. Maybe even more than the 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 hunter gatherer who's not able to find the lion and eat that day. So I wonder if elimination of pain and suffering is even possible. And can technology solve all our problems? I don't know. I think it's human nature to always want more. I think that's why celebrities are never happy. It's because once you establish that baseline, as you said, you want to get to the next high. That's why so many celebrities end up being drug addicts and you know all these bad things happen still but i don't want to say anything is impossible and to argue against your point um like depression is skyrocketing not just because like it is but like also because we didn't believe there was such thing as depression you know like a few hundred years ago like it wasn't a clinical diagnosis you were just sad or you know and suicide rates increasing could that be like the population increasing could it be that it's because we're not dying to other things like people that would have committed suicide maybe in the past they died to something else earlier on because we didn't have the medical technology to save them and uh it's like with ai and how like lots of jobs are being replaced and stuff you know maybe one day um, we won't need like truckers because cars will drive themselves. Maybe one day we won't need uh, waiters because we could just order from home or on a computer. And yes, there will be some like new jobs created. There will be a need for the developers of AI. But at one point, AI can program itself and there really won't be any need for human jobs anymore. I think it's the same thing. As we progress and... Uh, improve the well-being of people improve medical technology will solve a lot of problems but will also create a few new ones but at one point perhaps there won't be any more problems so you do do you define not having to work as a good thing then 
as like a taken away of suffering because I find that if you have nothing to work on, that's when you really take a hit with depression. Because I feel like we're very goal striving individuals and there's a sense of satisfaction we get when we're working hard on something. And the points where I've been lowest in mood, lowest in well-being are the points where I literally have nothing to work on. Like there's there's no schoolwork I have to do. There's no goal I want to achieve. And I think work is not a negative thing. I think it could be a really, really positive thing and a really, really negative thing based on the situation, right? I think through work, people have found a lot of fulfillment in life. If you're working on something you're really passionate about and you love, and we talked about it last time with, um, you know, I think we talked about purpose layers and like the uniqueness of the individual genetically and like how you love nutrition and I love other things. And I think if you can find the the work that you love, it can be a fulfilling thing. But if you end up in a job you hate, that's a negative thing. But I think having nothing to do, I think that will also give you like this weight on the head of like unease and tension because we're not designed to not do anything. So I feel like that that would add more suffering than remove suffering. But what do you think? I agree with you. I feel the same way when I'm not working. There was like a cloud hanging over me over break, honestly, when I wasn't doing anything at all. Um, but I think this futuristic like lack of a job kind of work that I'm talking about isn't necessarily a bad thing. Because just because you don't have a job to work for doesn't mean you don't have anything to work for in life. Like a few generations down the line, maybe everybody can focus on like, I don't know, working out, bodybuilding, stuff like that. That's tough work, but I like it. You know, you can do whatever you're passionate about. So yes, I think you need work, but not all work is good. And also I think you have to consider that maybe this need to work is kind of like a construct of society. Like we were born into this system where you have to go to school and go to work every day, but <laughs> would you feel the same way if you were raised in like a different family? What if you were raised as like a spoiled kid in this big rich family? Would you feel this pressure to work? Would you feel the same enjoyment when you work? I'm not sure because I feel like those spoiled kids who get everything that they want, they're still really happy and they've never needed to work and stuff like that, you know? I think those spoiled kids are the least unhappy. I think they're the most unhappy because <laughs> they're never satisfied. And you're, you're, so you're basically saying if a spoiled kid did not have to work, he'd feel really happy, but he kind of has to work. But I feel like that work that he has to do is the only thing that's kind of keeping him sane. If you have, if you're totally off the rails and you have no self motivation and you just want to fucking stimulate yourself, then I think those people are the least happy. <laughs> mm, yeah, I'd have to agree with you. I think, uh, I don't, I don't think I would rather be a spoiled kid. I'd rather be myself. <laughs> but my point was like, the reason that you and I find joy in work is because we have been working like that spoiled kid he doesn't he had never had to work but i guess his baseline is not having to do any work so he finds pleasure in like material goods and stuff which we'll have a lot of in the future and a few generations down the line maybe everybody will be like that like they'll be born into a world where they never have to work so any work is I guess, harder than their baseline like threshold of like how much I should work every day. And so they can find joy in other things. I do agree with the point you mentioned before that just because there's no mandatory work you have to do doesn't mean you will not work on anything, right? Because you mentioned a world where all you can do what you're passionate about. But I will say that through the school system, through the culture of work, we've developed this form of mindset and lifestyle of working if you if there's so much stimulation around you if there's so much access to a lifestyle where you don't have to work but oh you can work if you want to i think it'd be very easy to be like i don't want to work even though the person who somehow finds a self-motivation and discipline to push himself and work will probably be the happiest it's so easy to be live fall in a comfortable but complacent lifestyle in the modern world that i think it's kind of scary and you know it's it's a tough conversation to have because we're sitting here maybe thousands of years before this will even happen. Maybe we want to be around to see it um, as a species. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's a tough conversation, but it's at least from what I've seen in the present world of how this has already started happening, 
I think people who lack a sense of discipline and lack a sense of work that they enjoy are the least happiest. So I think we can only extrapolate that over the generation. That's really where my basis for the things I believe in come from. Well, I think you should ask the question of why do we work? We work because we want more things. Like we want more things in our life because if you're not religious, if you don't believe in any higher power and stuff, I guess one in your life is just same as any other animal, which is to like survive and reproduce. And so the reason that we work, I guess, is to achieve those two goals. But we're talking about like a completely different society where you can get those two things, where you can live and you can reproduce even if you don't work. So I think the mindset of these people would be completely different. I think the reason why we have such a problem with that idea is because we know that we can't live like that, which is why I think it's true. You do have to work in the society in order to get what you want, but maybe not in the one in the future. So your argument is that if you want to be able to have the resources that you desire, right, whether it be the money or the the, the fancy things, then you need to be able to, we need to work because we want those things. And your theory is that we'll have so much of these things that we want to work to achieve them. But does that mean we'll be satisfied with that? Because again, it's the baseline thing. If you're born with $2 trillion, is that going to make you be, okay, so I don't have to work because I already have access to that. Or will you be able, or will you say that I am not satisfied with that because that's the baseline and I want more than that because we'll see someone over there with $3 trillion. I don't think the work will ever end. I think you'll, I think humans by nature are always dissatisfied because <laughs> you see people with, who make $10 million a month and they're saying they are still dissatisfied. And I think, I don't think dissatisfaction is a bad thing, by the way, because I think the reason they got $10 million is because they were dissatisfied with their life. People who live, I think my biggest fear, we were thinking about this in our class the other day because for our mixed media project, we had to think about our biggest fear and build like some shield for um, some art project, whatever. And literally the first fear that came to mind is being satisfied with a mediocre life. Because I think I've always looked at dissatisfaction as a bad thing. And I've always valued finding fulfillment in life and not sacrificing happiness for an imaginary tomorrow. And I think I really achieved that at some points in my life where um, I spent my days, I felt productive throughout my day. I felt like I was still working toward things, but I still felt satisfied. But the people who live a mediocre life who don't really have the things they want, but are satisfied with it, are never going to get the things they want. And if you can self-impose some dissatisfaction and be like, I'm, I don't feel happy with what I have, then you're going to work hard to achieve the thing. And that's why I think the people who are most successful in life, just from an external perspective, right? The Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, who've made millions and millions of dollars, they only did it because they're they're so dissatisfied with their present life that they need more. They're so dissatisfied with $100 million, they need $200 million. Is that a bad thing? It could be a bad thing, but it's also the reason behind their success. Where was I going with that? I think I went on a little bit of a tangent on this way. But I think the point is that I don't think Elon Musk is going to get a trillion dollars and be like, okay, I don't have to work anymore. He wants to keep working because he's still dissatisfied. And I think that's a part of our human nature that I don't think work will necessarily go away the more we get. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a good mindset to have. You can never be too complacent. I think um, I might have talked about this with you on the last podcast, but I really thought I was going to get in college when I ED, right? So I was thinking to myself, like, I really need something else to work for. If I'm not going to work academically, then maybe I should push myself to do something like try some new things. That's why I joined wrestling because I feel like I needed another challenge to work for. So, and like, it turned out really well, even though I didn't get in college yet. Um, I ended up pushing myself like double time to like, you know, work for something to get better get more athletic and also get better academically. So I think it's a good mindset to have in this world. And I think it's a bit useless, honestly, to speculate about what's going to happen in the future because we don't, we don't have any idea what society is going to be like, because um, I think it's very optimistic to imagine the world will ever be a place where you can have wherever, what, like whatever you want. I think more realistically, like some people will have all the power. There's going to be a lot of inequality and everything. And so it'll be, it's pretty useless to speculate about that type of stuff. And I think what you said is like the correct mindset to have in the world that we live in today. Another thing I thought about recently was that um, whenever I hear projections of the future, they've always been negative, right? Oh, the future is going to be so bad. 
technology is going to rule us. We're going to be so depressed. And I always, when I think about the future, it's always a negative thing. And I thought, okay, fine. The future's going to suck, whatever. I was listening to Lex Friedman's podcast with Jeff Bezos. And one of the things I loved about it was that he had such a positive view of the future. Um, he's like, oh my God, I, I love these rocket ships. Oh, the future is going to be so great. We're going to be able to get a million people living in space and space stations and we'll come to Earth for vacation. He basically paid me, first of all, humanity is a really positive thing. And the future is a really positive thing, which honestly made me feel kind of good because like, okay, the, the future doesn't have to be painted as, as inherently negative. It could be a positive thing as well. And does painting the future as a negative thing even help us at all? Because... Yeah. It doesn't because like we're never gonna be there to experience it. So we're just gonna be sitting here thinking about how negative it's gonna be and then just ruin our life when we're not even gonna be there. And it could be positive, it could be completely great. Yeah, I think it's cause you know what they say about like um like clickbait stuff, like you know, negative news gets attention. Positive news doesn't get attention. That's partly why I think the future is painted so negatively it's because the people who say those negative things about the future they'll get the most attention so you won't ever hear positive things because nobody cares nobody's excited by that i guess um but yeah i'm pretty i'm pretty excited for the future i think right now we're in the middle of like a big big shift in society when it comes to like ai and stuff like that and if you jump jump aboard that train I think you'll be ahead of a lot of people. It's like, like this is the time where people can really shift their position in society, where the people at the bottom can rise to the top, people at the top can fall. Ryan Liu, thank you so much for coming down for our second podcast. I have to say, I've done, this is the 25th podcast, and I've had conversations with a lot of people, but I recognize that with you, I could just flow for hours. Like we could talk for hours. Like We could start not knowing absolutely what the fuck we're going to talk about, then we start talking about, and we end up talking an hour about sleep, and then we get into the future of humanity. But we just let it flow. And I would love to do more throughout the spring because I think these are really natural, very interesting conversations. Um, we got to get some more hikes in in spring and this summer. But excited for that, man! So good luck with everything going forward. Thank you. It's a pleasure talking with you. If you enjoyed that episode with Ryan Liu, then you're going to enjoy this episode right here with Brown Show, where we talk about the importance of discipline in living a better life. Make sure you hit that link right now, and don't forget to like and subscribe anymore.